is where we get into the discipleship side of it. Most of the transformation that takes place in people's lives is not the emergency, uh, just had this disaster in my life, counseling advice that you give them from the word. Most of the change is long-term change needed, like the taming of that lifelong problematic temper, that lifelong problematic anxiety or fear. See, those are discipleship issues. Not Usually counseling is for a, you know, a crisis situation that you know, then they're seeking someone's help at that moment. Discipleship is a long-term change. So that's what we're getting into. So page 63, he, they call it, Mr. Broger calls it man's way and God's way. What I'm going to do is start turning, and I'm really going to start on the bottom of page uh, 70. Uh, Marty, next week, is going to cover everything else in the chapter that I don't cover. Uh, and I'm going to hopscotch around just to make life fun for him. But uh, while you're parked there on page 70, uh, when the, the theme for tonight, and this is, this is really the overarching theme of lesson four onward, that the Christian life works best when we follow God's instructions. Now, we don't have to follow God's instructions. Look at our bodies. I mean, our bodies work best if we regularly sleep, eat healthy food, and exercise. Do most Americans do that? No. Do their bodies work? Most of them. Do they work the best way that God designed them to work? No. See, God lets us live not according to his instructions. But we miss living life the best way, the way that God designed it to be. So the operating instructions for how to live life for Christ in any culture. And I want to explain to you that the Bible is supracultural. Isn't that neat to think about? It transcends any culture. In fact, it works in any culture. We are not the first generation with the Bible. Uh, there have been all the generations of God's people since the birth of Christ's church that have operated in every kindred and tongue and tribe and nation around the world. The gospel went out around the world in the first century. It operates in any culture, it operates in any country, and in any time period in history. And that Operating instruction is given by God in his word. The owner's manual that shows us how to assemble. I mean, do you ever get, I mean, Christmas is coming. Dads, how many of us, you know, have bought something for the kids and we have to put it together? I mean, I can't tell you how many tricycles I put together and wagons, you know, those red. They were always cheaper, unassembled at the hardware. And, of course, we were poor, so we got the, the wagon that was in the box this big. You know, you wonder how you could make the wagon out of such a little thing. But you, Bonnie would say, have you read the owner's manual? I said, no, I'm just going to put it together. <laughs> That's how most people live life. But the owner's manual that shows us how to assemble and operate and repair and maintain and best utilize our grace-enabled spiritual life is the Bible. See, that's the operating manual. That's the instructions. How to assemble a life that pleases God. How to assemble a life that operates the way God designed it to be. And that's what, when there's an emergency, when there's a disaster, that's what counseling steps in to do. But in the long term, when, when there is a desire for life change. Like parents get to the point where they say, I, I just, I need help in knowing how to raise my children. Or the couple, I need help in knowing how to have a marriage that's, that mine just doesn't seem to be the way that God said it was. Be. That's long-term discipleship. And that's, that's uh, the first fill in the blank. The Christian life works best when we follow the instructions. And you can fill that in. Peter also told us near the end of his life, all things needed for living for Christ in this world are in God's word. See, that's how neat this is. That shows the omniscience of God. God knew that in every culture, in every time period, in every country that this book would ever go to, everything that anybody needed in any of those settings and time periods, including our own and as far in the future as God allows humanity to go, that everything that pertains to life, how to operate in everyday life in a dark and warped world, and that pertains to godliness, that means how to please God by growing in conformity for his plan for us, have been given in the Bible. And that's what 2 Peter uh, 1, 3, and 4 say. And, and here it is for you. His divine power. See, in, in our counseling, 
In fact, I was talking to someone this week, and um, uh, they were saying, let's see, it was such an interesting context, but somehow they were talking about this class. And I said, I said, you know what? I can talk about anything. I can. I, I remember when I was on staff with John MacArthur, it's the first time I ever heard what I felt. He looked at me and he says, you know, I can talk about anything in the world. He says, I can, I can sell anything. MacArthur, when I worked with him, he said, I could sell anything. I can talk about anything. He says, my biggest problem is when I open my mouth that I say what God wants to use rather than me being able to talk about anything. And, and this person was saying, oh, you know, um, your stories are so much fun and all this stuff, and I learned so much in the class. And I said, but you know what? There's only one thing that's important to realize. Because what they were saying is that they could never counsel like I did. And I says, no, you could probably counsel better. Do you know why? The, the weaker we are and the less confident we are, the more we need what? What, what does Peter say that God has given us? Divine power. When you open this book, that's the travesty of so much counseling goes on. They never open the divine power source. They never invoke. Remember part of our grow thing is that we're supposed to cry out for the Holy Spirit's power? God says everything that we need to pertain to our life, how to live life, his divine power has, has provided that. And all we have to do is unleash it. And... Uh, and, and show people the great and precious promises so that by faith we can partake of the divine nature. Do you know what the divine nature means? It means the Spirit of God living in me changes me. It's actually, if you want to know what salvation offers, it offers what, boy, I'll tell you what, every psychiatrist in the country wish they could do this. God offers a personality transplant. You ever heard of heart, lung, liver, knee? You know, all these, these replacements we get? God offers personality transplants. You don't like your personality? Great. You can have a partaking of the divine nature. What does that look like? Well, the Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy. Whose personality is that? Christ. See, salvation is I get Christ's personality transplanted into me, and the more that I escape the corruption that's in the world, the more he shows. It's amazing to think about. Okay, the essence of the life of the believer in the New Testament was how to live out Christ in the world. How, how were they supposed to live out Christ back then in Israel, back then in the Roman Empire, back then in the Middle Ages? The scriptures say it's by being anchored in God's word. That's why the Dark Ages were really hard on the church because the Roman Catholic Church removed from the people what? The Bible. And that's why it was such a dark time. But what's neat is the Bible says we live out Christ being anchored to the word. But look at this. In the context of the church, the body of Christ. Next point. Isolation from nurturing relationships is bad. And, and, and what we're going into tonight is that probably far more than counseling, this class is more about discipling because that's where the long-term long -term change comes from. But isolation from nurturing relationships is bad. The norm for the New Testament believer is not isolation, it is community. You understand that the Bible was operating not in little islands, but in a community setting. The danger of anonymity and isolation is that it effectively insulates a believer from other spirit-filled believers. Did you know I need other believers to encourage, to, to stimulate, to admonish, to, to uh, speak into my life the, the word of God that I need from him? And God's word, and let's open to Hebrews chapter 10. Keep your books to page 70, but we're getting there. But Hebrews chapter 10, and this should be a well-marked passage in your Bible. And if it's not, start tonight, you know, putting a star or an arrow or something. But Hebrews 10, uh, starting in verse 22, uh, God warns about the deadening results of the absence of other spirit-filled believers exhorting, admonishing, and encouraging my life. Now, I just have to underline that. Did you know that even at Calvary, there are people 
that are experiencing the deadening results of trying to avoid spirit-filled believers getting close enough to them to exhort, admonish, and encourage their life. Do you know why? They don't want to get involved in, in a life group, in a small group, in a home group, because they don't want people getting to know them too well for whatever reason. Now look what they're missing. This is what we miss by that. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now that's a continuation of what starts way back in chapter 9 and verse 14 about the power of the blood of Christ uh, that, that cleanses us at salvation. So because of salvation, we have the privilege to draw near with full assurance. That's the benefit, the byproduct of salvation. But look at verse 23. Let us hold fast our confession of hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So in other words, that means that just have, have the assurance, stick to it, don't let go. But now, why? What happens? Verse 24. Let us consider one another. Stop just looking on your own things. Remember how the scriptures say that? Look, not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of what? Others. Let us look outside of our life and consider one another. And here's what we're supposed to look for in other people's lives. We are supposed to, when we gather on Sunday, we're trying to stir up love and good works in as many people as possible. Did you know that Every time the church gathers, all of us are supposed to be stirring each other up. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. I'm so comforted by that. Even back when Paul and Peter and John and James were ministering, people didn't come. They went, oh, it's too often, too much, too hard. I already got enough. Once a month is enough for me. There were people back then that did not, they forsook the gathered church, even in the first century. But those that came, they exhorted one another and so much the more as they saw the day approaching. This, this is the context that, that the scripture is written in, that we consider how to stir up and build up one another. So here, here's what I told you, the new uh, dimension that we're going into starting in the fourth lesson. Discipleship is personal, long-term change counseling. It's counseling for long-term change. God is asking each of us to live in such a way that our life can become a pattern. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, it says, Be followers together of me, even as I also am of Christ. That Paul wasn't the only one. We're all supposed to live in such a way that our life can become a pattern of his grace that can be used to mentor someone else, to encourage someone else, to coach someone else, to tutor, to teach, to train, to guide another's life toward Christ. Uh, in fact, at every level, um, this is, I mean, if, if you are, are young parents, then your primary uh, ministry is to your children. In fact, um, what's, what's amazing is, I was sharing this at the staff meeting uh, this week. I said, you know, a lot of people are always looking for ministry. And, and the question is, are you, if you have some little people at home, are you mentoring, encouraging, coaching, tutoring, teaching, and training them? Or do you just dump them off here and hope we do? Because you know who is responsible for them. We're not. We're, we're like vitamins around here. Calvary Bible Church is like a bottle of vitamins for your kids. The food comes at home spiritually. That is, did you know Sunday school did not start until 1789? The apostles never thought of it. They never thought of Sunday school. The context of growth was the home. The nurture of the children was the home. It wasn't Sunday school. Robert Rakes did it in 1789 in, in London because of all the street urchins that were orphans. They didn't, did you know that, that kids and church families didn't go to Sunday school? Only the street kids went to Sunday school. Everybody else went to church because they were nurtured at home. So we, we have to realize that, that if you're young parents, your target is your, your children. If you are married, your target is your partner. 
pr that's the first target before we, th you know, people are always saying, I need a ministry. Who's someone I can mentor? Well, do you have children? Are you mentoring them? It's kind of like when we send people off to the mission field, if they can't lead people to Christ in Kalamazoo, do you think they're going to all of a sudden be transformed when they get to France? No. You see, we have to, we have to, to borrow from that horrible theologian, one phrase he got right, the Holland theologian, his name was Robert Schuller, uh, our power guy, he used to say, bloom where you're planted. I don't think he thought of that, but it's a good spiritual principle. If you're married, practice your discipleship on your partner. If you're a young parent, practice it on your kids. If, if you have adult children, they're out of the home, then you have more slots for adding people into your life uh, after your husband or wife is covered. But keep going. There's nothing greater in life than to be useful to God, and Christ Church was born into a sin-warped, sin-darkened world of mixed-up marriages, sin-scarred lives, and confused families. Can you imagine what the New Testament world was like when this thing broke? And so men and women were gloriously saved, but they didn't automatically become... Just because you got saved, you don't become a great wife and mother or a husband and father. When they came to Christ and were forgiven, God graciously gave them everything they need to become godly wives and mothers and husbands and fathers, but they needed something else. See, this is the essence of the context. People don't even realize the context of the Bible is it was written, these epistles were written to new believers that needed coaching, training, and modeling, and encouraging in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And the early church was all about godly behavior being taught to them as a series of choices. And those men and women had to be nurtured in the daily skills that would lead to loving marriages and families. This is what the New Testament epistles were all about. They were taking these mixed up, sin-scarred and confused people, which is how all of us are when we're saved, and mentoring us into how to become no one instantly gets saved and is a perfect wife, mother, or husband, or father, or child. It's coaching. It's training. It's watching. That's why we gather. Sometimes what you do isn't even spoken. People watch it. This is a spoken, encouraging, uh, and coaching training, of course, is. Okay. Christ's method for training new converts was twofold. They gathered for a group session as an entire church body. The scriptures were faithfully taught. Remember, that's Timothy. Preach the word. Be instant in season. And they were fed healthy doctrine. That group teaching of the gathered church was, vert, was vitally performed by the called and gifted pastors. But side and side with that didactic teaching was another equally group, uh, equally uh, vital group. And that's this, discipleship and counseling. The mentoring of believers in truth. That's what... Paul was calling people. That's what, what Romans 15 that we started our course with is saying. That I know that you're full of godliness and are able to admonish. So discipleship and counseling means mentoring believers in truth. And this is a transition. We're going from just mere principles of counseling that we ended last week to the discipleship counseling format. In fact... Uh, this, this begins one of the most interesting sections of this whole course, actually in January, because we're looking at how do you prompt long-term change in what we would call our besetting sins. Most of us just say, I've always struggled with this one, or I've always struggled with whatever. And the Bible says, no, uh, you can change in that area. Uh, the key to all spiritual growth is, and, and this is what uh, long-term discipleship is about, Cooperation with the mortification side of sanctification. It's kind of like Roundup applied to weeds. The Spirit of God applied to our besetting sins. Any that we allow the Spirit of God to mortify, these sins become mortally wounded and never again have the same hold on us as they had. That's why when you're around a group of people, uh, they see incremental change, and that's how they encourage us. Uh, see, believers say, you know what, Bill? You're not as ornery as you used to be. And you say, I know, it's the Lord. Because you're, you're not as, as impatient as you used to be. In fact, those closest to you uh, should see that. They should see change. Okay, uh, what are some of the weeds that can blow up in the yards of our life and start growing? Well, 
all spiritual weeds uh, uh, are listed, at least the ones that all of us have, starting on page 70. So let me just read through these with you. Uh, and uh, by the way, as I read this, one of the theme verses for this is, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto your name give glory. The weeds we all have is we're all self-focused. And what it says, uh, number one, at the bottom on page 70, the error of man's way concerning self-worth. And so what we say about that is the error of trusting the world's definition of self-worth. Because we were born sinners, we only deserve death. See, this is something that, that most people need a re review on. The, our world, I mean, if you listen very long, they're all saying, you have self-worth. No. Our true self-worth is actually negative. It's actually a debt. We are debtors to God because of our sin from birth onward. We actually don't have worth in, that, in the sense of self worth. We do not deserve merit or have a right to God's favor. It's only his grace that shined into our hearts. Did you know that a, th this notion that everybody is worth so much, did you know that everyone is worth so much that, that they are headed with all that worth to hell without divine intervention? To get out of the negative territory. See, sin negates the, the, the image of God. You know, a lot of people say, well, everybody's got all this worth because they're in the image of God. Uh-huh, but it's, it is so, so uh, marred by sin that from birth onward that only his grace can put us in the positive territory. The second one, if you flip the page to 71, is uh, the error of man's regarding Self-assurance. Uh, we should not trust the world's definition of self-assurance. Only the Lord gives anything that's good or perfect. It's a gift from above, as it says in James 1. A gift means it's unearned, unmerited, undeserved. What assures us is the character of the giver. That's what we get assurance in. His mercy, his love, his grace, his kindness. We seek to follow him, be more dependent on him rather than ourself, our possessions, or whatever. And then all the rest of these, you can read them. We need to, to beware and put roundup on the world's definition of self-love, self-assertiveness. You know, if you don't assert yourself, you never get anywhere. Really. Uh, the Lord says that the way to the top is, is by humbling ourselves, and he lifts us up. It's very fascinating that the people that were most lifted up in the scriptures, as in Joseph and Daniel and Moses, none of them saw it. And, and David, I mean, David wasn't seeking. God loves to promote those that humble themselves before him. Self-confidence, self-esteem, self-righteousness, and all that. And so basically, what, as you read through this, and by the way, you understand that I just introduced this stuff. You can read all this on your own. I'm not going to read it to you because uh, this class has just introduced you to this fourth lesson. But the essence is this. Following Jesus is the call of every believer. In fact, this is what 1 John 2 says, another one of the verses you're going to bump into this month. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Isn't that interesting? That's Christ's expectation of us. Okay, so discipleship is learning to follow Jesus. Uh, although the word discipleship is a common term, and it's used all the time in many churches, we don't see Christ-like people developing as readily as it's talked about. We live in a land where millions of born-again Christians are suffering from acute biblical illiteracy. Did you know that? Talk, talk to someone very long about the Bible, and you'll see a puzzled look on their face. Because most people have an acute biblical illiteracy. Many of them are enslaved to culture-accommodating lifestyles. In other words... A culture accommodating lifestyle is, uh, for example, your job is more important than the fellowship of the saints. Sports are more important than the fellowship of the saints. Academics are more important than the fellowship of the saints. I could go, money is more important. Entertainment is more important. That is a lifestyle that we accommodate that we've learned from our culture. It, in fact, I had another discussion with someone this week about their job, and they said, if I said at work, 
what the Bible says, I would lose my job. I said, welcome to the first century. That's why they lost their jobs. And their, as it says in the book of Hebrews, they took joyfully the spoiling of their goods because they esteemed Christ, promised them something exceeding better. Do you know why they were persecuted in the first century? Not because they kept their mouth closed. Because they didn't. And that's why our culture accommodating lifestyles, uh, Romans 12 says, were squeezed into the mold. In fact, we had, uh, Sunday we had a visiting pastor. I don't remember where he's from. Some 100 miles away or something. He was on vacation. He said, I'm going to come to Calvary because um, they just enjoy coming and, and, and learning from a different church. And the guy came up to me in the visitor line right over here, this reception area, and he said, you have a lot of nerve. He said, I could never say to my congregation what you said this morning. I said, but isn't it in the Bible? He says, yeah, they wouldn't tolerate it. And I said, culture accommodating lifestyle. We're all used to it. People won't tolerate if you tell them the truth. Uh, quote, perhaps the greatest single weakness of the contemporary Christian church is that millions of supposed members are not really involved at all. And what is worse, they don't think it's strange that they're not. Isn't that interesting? Millions of supposed members of, of Christ church aren't involved in Christ church at all. They attend. That's not involvement. Attending is not involvement. Uh, as soon as we recognize Christ's intention to make his church a militant company, we understand at once that the conventional arrangement cannot suffice. There's no real chance of victory in a campaign if 90% of the soldiers are untrained and uninvolved. But that's exactly where we stand now. Now, that's, that's a 39, 49, 51-year-old quote from an author, but it's more true today than 51 years ago. Continuing, if this is fascinating, and make sure you fill in the blanks here. In analyzing the Gospels, we find that Jesus met with the multitudes no less than 17 times, but his small group sessions numbered how many? 46. Now think about this. Although this is just an observation, we could conclude that Christ's plan was to offer a mix of 25% large group sessions and 75% small group nurturing, discipleship, hands-on demonstrations, and accountability. Now, think about this. Can you think about how transformational it would be if all of us were involved in a small group where it was regular every week that they said, okay, we're going to this week, we're going to all practice how to pray better. So we're just going to all uh, get in small groups and we're going to pray with people that have prayed longer than us and we're going to all pray together and they're going to help you pray better. The next week we're all going to talk about Bible study and everybody that's studied a long time is going to tell their favorite tips. The next week we're all going to talk about scripture memory. We're all going to share what verses we know and if you don't know any, you're going to start this time. Look, look at this. This hands-on demonstrations and accountability. That's what the church is supposed to be. Wesley put, this, put it this way, I'm more and more convinced. This is John Wesley from the 18th century, England, uh, revivalist, founder of Methodism. I am more and more convinced that the devil himself desires nothing more than this, that the people of any place should be half awakened and then left to themselves to fall asleep again. What he's saying, he's talking about 18th century England, you know, where they had all these churches that were half awakening people, but they never brought them to, to discipleship, hands-on demonstrations and accountability, and they just went back to sleep. Fascinating thought. Um, so, in 1743, John Wesley organized a society. It was called the Methodism. See, Methodism is, he had a method. And it was a small group. It was Methodism. Now, uh, primarily, I would say this. All the Methodists in the world, and I'm, I'm not being mean. Uh, Bonnie and I were invited uh, a few years ago. Maybe five, five, six years ago. I can't remember. But uh, we were invited to take 96 Methodist pastors on a tour, they asked me if I'd go and teach them uh, the land of the book. And so we did, you know, the churches of Paul and, 
Asia, Europe, and the islands. And it was really, I mean, wow. We ate on this big boat, gigantic meals, and every time we stopped, I'd take them in to Philippi or, you know, uh, Berea, uh, Thessalonica, Crete. It was really fun. You know, I found right away 96 pastors, they didn't know the Bible. In fact, a lot of them weren't Christians. I can honestly say that. In fact, I, I started at the sites preaching the gospel. Because Methodism, I'm not saying every Methodist, but Methodism primarily has become an organization. It's kind of like the YMCA. Nobody's young anymore and there aren't men and it's not Christian, it's just an association. You know, That's what Methodism uh, became over the years. It became liberal. Now I know there's you know, evangelical and free Methodist and everything else. But I'm talking about what Wesley started of everybody following this method of personal accountability, nurture and discipleship, and making sure everybody was saved is gone. But here's what he said. Such a society is no other than a company of men having the form and seeking the power of godliness, united in order to pray together, to receive the word of exhortation, and to watch over one another in love that they may help each other to work out their own salvation. That's what Methodism was founded to be. The rest is history. From Wesley's ministry, the Methodist Church began to spread across the world in evangelism and missionary work. The results were astounding. England's culture was shaken to the core. Wesley started attacking the, the culture of drunkenness, of, of neglect. Of, it was just amazing what he did. He taught people how to read by teaching them songs, and then they would follow along in the hymn book with their fingers, and they learned to read at church because it was an illiterate society. Churches began to grow everywhere in England. British missions spanned the globe. But as with most great movements, the types of ministry like that. In fact, Bonnie and I uh, had a layover there a couple years ago, so we went. I was so excited. Let's go see where Methodism started. We got there. And it's a United Nations heritage site that's committed. We looked at the program. They were having homosexual, lay, lesbian, transgender, you know, one world Wicca stuff. There was nothing about Christ in the whole founding Wesley building that's the size of a city block. And it was just, it was just, it was disheartening uh, where it's gotten. Well, what's happened to the church of the 21st century? And, and now we're winding down because we need to. Christians that were baptized into the hope of both eternal life and newness of life are often not successful in living out Christ in practical ways. The most likely, this is most likely because the biblical concept of teaching is becoming more of a telling or a pointing. People point to available resources rather than the prescribed lifestyle demonstration that God had Paul initiate for all the churches, especially, for example, in the Titus 2 passage. The lack of discipleship we've already studied was warned about in Hebrews. Uh, it says that, that the time that we should be teaching others, uh, we, we need milk. We need someone to teach us. We aren't ready for solid stuff. Why? Because we do not constantly have training ourselves. in the. And we covered that about four weeks ago. Uh, no discipleship produces spiritual immaturity. What is spiritual immaturity? A marginal desire for God's word. A person who walks in the flesh, they don't know the difference between walking in the flesh and the spirit. They, they hardly have any evidence of being filled with the works of faith. They're easily swayed or deceived by false doctrines. I mean, as long as the book has a pretty cover, they read it. As long as the show is uplifting, they believe it. They follow it. Stuck in the basics. No growth. No measurable growth. No growth in, in sanctification. A limited desire for fellowship with other believers. One of the signs of spiritual immaturity is, oh, man, once a month's enough for me. Oh, once a week. I mean, a Wednesday night? A small group? Mm-mm. Strong desire for worldly possessions. In fact, most of their goals are material. Constantly showing they're very ambitious for themselves and very competitive. Always trying to one-up. That's a sign of spiritual maturity. Uh, very hard to repent and forgive others. Very lacking compassion. Uh, not actively assisting spiritual development. 
And I mean, you can read the rest. I mean, those are signs of, of spiritual maturity. Okay, Christ's words to his disciples should be our first priority. Follow me. Remember, that's what Jesus said in Bethsaida. That's, that's how he introduced himself to the disciples, the 12. Well, actually, to the four fishermen, the first of the 12, he says, follow me. Two words, follow me. It was simple. Which leads us to the final element. And this is where, this is kind of an outline of where we're going uh, in all the months ahead. You can read the chart yourself. It's on page 74. I'm not going to cover it. Probably Marty will next week. But basically, for the rest of our, our weeks uh, in, in this discipleship, we're going to look at the, the wrong ways to view problems in life. See, this, this, this axis is uh, what's going on in our life, and this axis shows everything that's wrong and the one that's right. And so uh, this chart I would commend to you um, as you're going through, and especially three of the weeks of this month, we're not even together. This kind of sets out the discipleship mode that we're going to be talking about for about the next 14 lessons. Uh, basically what the scriptures say we're supposed to do. So we have exactly 12 minutes. And so what I would encourage you to do in your groups is, after you work on Bonnie's poem and song and plan what cookies you're going to have, uh, uh, talk over uh, any of these points and make sure you have a prayer time. Next week, Marty, cover everything else in the chapter, okay? And our homework, Bonnie said, what is our homework? I said, your homework is always from when I introduced chapter four, which is now, your homework now switches from chapter three to chapter four. So this is our, our verse. It's right here in the front. Remember, uh, it's on the beginning of the chapter and the homework's in there. Okay, God bless you. Talk in your small groups.